Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the third presentation of the artists who exhibited in the Kunstmatrix virtual show, Kinship with Birds in Flight and Plight. And we're lucky to have uh, artists here from around the world and also the juror. So I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. My name is Mary White. I'm one of the co-chairs. And please, if you wish, type your location and land acknowledgement in the chat. Weed's office sits on the territory of the Weechen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the Va sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. And we are near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area, including my house. Mm. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwimaka. Jane, please help me pronounce it correctly. Muwimaka. Muwekma, Ohlone tribe, and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize the Muwekma Alomi tribe and who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the Association of Rameitush Ohlone, who are researching, revitalizing, and preserving Rameitush Ohlone history and culture, and the Confederated Village of the Lejeune and the Sikorite Land Trust, who are working to return native land back to the indigenous stewardship. Um, I'd like to introduce Christina Bertia, who is a board member who's going to be leading the presentations. And before we do that, a little Zoom housekeeping. We're recording this presentation and please keep your audio muted during the presentation. And it's possible the hosts may mute you if there's extra noise. If you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat for the questions section. We'll stop the first recording after the 45 minute presentation and then immediately start a second recording with question for questions and answers. And so the total presentation and questions will go a half hour and a half. So I just wanted to say a couple of things about WEED. A WEED was founded in 1996. It's a volunteer run collective of female identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. And we are always open to new ideas and new plans. And we have a little tiny bit of wonderful news. We were, December 1st, we got the official news that we are have been received, will receive a, a two-year operational grant from the California Arts Council for $25,000 each year. So we'll be able to pick up our directory, which is really having some problems. So with that note, I'll introduce Christina Bertia, and she will, and also I would like to introduce Jane Kim. So I guess Christina is going to introduce Jane. All right. Thank you, Mary. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Jane Kim, our juror, whose work is about art, wonder, and the natural world. We'd invited her to jury this exhibition because of her public art throughout the country, especially the wall of birds that she painted at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She has a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and a master's certificate in science illustration from California, California State University, Monterey Bay. Creating art to catalyze love, awareness, and protection of the natural world, her migrating mural campaign highlights wildlife along migration corridors that, that wildlife shares with people, such as our own Highway 395 on the east side of California. We welcome you, Jane, and please share whatever thoughts you would like about the exhibition and your own work. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Weed. It is such a wonderful pleasure to be here tonight. And of course, last but not least, thank you, artists, for submitting all of your uh, wonderful work. Um, one of the things that I, so uh, Christina did a, an amazing job of giving you a little bit um, 
of history of my bio, but um, I do have a very near and dear relationship with birds, especially. Um, the Wall of Birds is at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it depicts all of the families of birds that were identified and um, present in 2015, along with the um, evolution of birds on the stairwell. Um, and so I do also um, having a practice in public art feel very strongly about the power of art to move people, to tell stories. And those stories are exactly what I was interested in when I was reviewing each of your pieces, was reading your statements, your bios. Um, it really did help me shape my own experience with the artwork. Um, and so one of the things that I did love about this format um, on as a virtual exhibit was that it really allowed for people to engage with one another's statements and for the general public to really engage with each of your statements. So I'm very looking forward to hearing what um, more you have to say about each one of your works. Um, so congratulations again, and I look forward to your presentations. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops. So this is our little poster announcing the show. So we're gonna start with Hillary Baker. Hi, um, I'm really pleased to take part in this very topical exhibition. And I want to thank uh, especially the WEED staff and Christina and Jane Kim for this opportunity. I'm going to start off with a bit of background about this particular piece. Um, for the past six years, I've been working on a series of paintings entitled Predators, where I'm depicting local wildlife and I'm juxtaposing them against their urban and their rural habitats. The first bird I painted was a barn owl for a show titled Birdie, and it was at Coastline College. And the artists were invited to choose a bird from among the wild birds in the Upper Newport Ecological Reserve in Southern California, specifically the South Bay. And the owl that I painted was really the beginning of the Predators series. To date, I've painted nine different birds from crows to herons to roadrunners, and I've placed them among a range of urban, suburban, and um, rural locales. But it was the setting of this painting, Burrowing Owl LAX, that particularly resonated with me. It's based on the project to return the burrowing owl to its habitat in the former Los Angeles sand dune beachfront community of Surf Ridge. Surf Ridge was a two mile stretch of 800 homes and it was originally developed in the 1920s and the 1930s. The adjacent airport at the time was, um, was uh, rather small and it was used uh, only for commercial flights for um, prop planes. But as Los Angeles grew, uh, so did the need for a much larger airport and it needed to accommodate jet travel. So by the 1960s, the jets flying over Surf Ridge, over the community, brought noise, jet fumes, and lawsuits. And in the 1960s and the 70s, the area was condemned, and it was acquired by the city of Los Angeles through eminent domain. The homeowners were forced to sell their properties to the city, and eventually all the houses were raised um, or moved so that by the early 70s, what was left behind were the home's foundations, the retaining walls and utility lines. And essentially it was a ghost town sealed off with fencing, which then as land left alone often tends to do evolved into a nature preserve. Four years ago, scientists discovered 10 burrowing owls in the 302 acre preserve. They were the most seen there in four decades. So there's great optimism that they are thriving because there is no place um, else left for them in Los Angeles. These sand dunes now support a growing list of protected and endangered species like the El Segundo blue butterfly, this California gnat catcher and the legless lizard. And the goal is to introduce more species as the preserve expands. The animals that I paint invariably look back at us with wariness, alarm, or defiance. I chose to depict this owl with an expression of concern. I've placed her on the tarmac and under the flight plan of a jet to underscore how precarious her existence is. 
The wood grain texture of her body is one way I link my animals to their environment. The danger of the loss of this environment is not limited to the burrowing owl, but also to countless bird species equally vulnerable in the face of encroaching development. This is an important and timely topic. So who better than artists to bring it to the forefront? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Kate Gorin Smith. Kate, you're up. Yes, thank you. All right, I, um, I would like to start uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and also the Bunyurong people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which this work was made. I'd like to pay my respects to their cultures and customs, which have nurtured and continue to nurture this, this land since time immemorial, to their elders past and present, and also to the rich tradition of Indigenous art and storytelling that is so alive and inspiring today. Um, I'm really thrilled um, to be part of this wonderful project, which has also introduced me to weed, which is pretty exciting as well. Um, and thank you so much, especially to um, yeah the weed staff and to Jane for curating kinship with birds and including my work. Um, so I'm um, based in, in Melbourne, in the southeast coast of Australia. And my background is I'm a, primarily a printmaker. Uh, and for about a decade, I've been making art and running um, Australia-wide projects to try and raise awareness for migratory shorebirds and their habitat. Um, mainly, well, I have emotional connections to them, but um, particularly because migratory shorebirds are um, our most endangered group of birds. Um, the big project that I, I currently run, which is an ongoing project since 2017, uh, the aim of it is to engage Again, primarily printmakers, but anybody can enjoy uh, can join the project. Um, it's called the Overwintering Project, and it encourages artists to go out into to find their local migratory shorebird habitat, and to make work about it to share with their family and friends and community to foster a sense of stewardship with that habitat. Because often, like um, Hilary was just saying about the the, the barking owl, often um, because shorebirds are around the shore, which is prime habitat to be used for development and um, um, uh, re reclamation, uh, often the habitat that they've been coming to for so many thousands of years is, is not pristine and it's not what people think of as being a beautiful place. So, um, yeah, so to get people out there actually seeing these wonderful birds that make migrations. So they migrate from Australia and New Zealand. They spend October to May here in their non-breeding period and the flyway that we're on, so that's the route that migratory birds fly, is called a flyway and there's eight around the globe. And the one that Australia is on is called the East Asian Australasian Flyway. It's the most pressured flyway of all the eight flyways because we've got two thirds of the world's population on our flyway. Um, and it stretches along the Eastern seaboard from Australia in, um, of, of Asia, from Australia and New Zealand in the South up to Alaska and Siberia in the North. Mm -hmm. um, so this print uh, is a is a very large lino cut of an eastern curlew, which is our most is it's our largest and also our most endangered shorebird. Um, their population has been reduced by um, eighty percent in the last um, three decades. So I think there's about a thousand birds left. Um, wow. Yes, but they come to our shores, and we're very very lucky that they do. And um, my work is particularly based. So Melbourne is built on a bay that's called Port Phillip Bay. And um, next to that, to the actually to the east, is Western Port Bay, and that's where I do a lot of my work. Um, Western Port is a, is a site that's continually under um, threat from development. Um, and, in fact, I made this piece for an exhibition at the time of the last um, big threat, which was from the uh, a gas company that wanted to build a regasification plant in the bay. And luckily, while the exhibition was on, um, the project was rejected. So that was very exciting. 
So this um, bird is roughly human sized. And when it's up on the wall, she's looking right in the eye, looking right in the eye, which is to establish very much this feeling of kinship with birds and the respect for the non-human inhabitants of the world um, so that we can look her in the eye and consider her an equal being with equal needs and an equal right to call our shores her home. So that's really the story of this work. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, Cynthia Jensen uh, is missing in action. So Mary will read her statement from the catalog. those of you who just came in, we're going to have a catalog available for this show. Spill King, Spill Kill, number two, is made of an oil can with a long spout for the beak. It has been combined with a recycled handmade grater, which I have painted to look like feathers dripping with oil. The eyes are parts of rusty screws and the Feathers are plastic hair clips and accessories. Oil spill kill mil oil spills kill millions of birds each year. The oil causes bird feathers to separate, which impacts the bird's ability to repel water or conserve heat. Their ability to fly is also hampered by oil on their feathers. In the process of trying to clean themselves, Birds ingest the oil, which causes damage to the bird's internal organs. The hull rung, hung birds I have created illustrate some of these issues by incorporating recycled oil cans as body parts and shiny, spiky plastic feathers to represent their oil-covered plumage. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Hi, so hi. Uh, I'm Danielle. I, I just wanted to also say it's so great to be part of this exhibit. It's very important and really wonderful to be in a community with everyone who loves birds and just great to hear about it. So thanks again, Jane and everyone at Weed for this opportunity. Um, quick background about me. I am a recent college graduate from Maryland Institute College of Art, where I studied in general fine arts and graphic design and sustainability and social practices. Uh, my area of interest depicts environmental issues through the intersection of research, fine art, and graphic design. My project, Bye Bye Birdies, came to fruition after being moved by the recent reports on the decline of 2.9 billion birds since 1970, uh, as well as Audubon's Survival by Degrees report. <clears throat> the latter report reveals that 68% or two-thirds of the North American birds are at risk of extinction due to human-caused cli human climate change and disturbances such as deforestation and habitat loss. Uh, so my installation explores these findings, visualizing the levels of extinction vulnerability of around 100 bird species. Um, and then each bird is made true to size as best as possible, uh, created from hand, hand painted, embroidered and laser cut wood. They are installed in a way that creates an, an immersive graph where the birds placed higher from the ground are safer, but birds placed lower to the ground are more threatened to be extinct under a three degree warming scenario. It's hard to see in the image, but I further emphasize this point with colored borders around the nape tags that are next to the birds. So the colors go from blue being safe to red being ex extremely threatened. And none of the birds I made to be flying or have legs since they unfortunately don't uh, don't have control of their fate, only we do. Um, and the birds on the wall all face in the middle display case in front of them, which lies these stuff painted passenger pinions. Um, Here's like an example of one. Um, and I make an homage to them since they were once the most abundant bird in Americas, ranging from around three to five billion, but were wiped out within a 40 year time span due to increased deforestation and overhunting. So these taxidermy pigeons were foreshadow the potential fate of our feathered friends unless action is not swift, uh, unless action is swiftly taken. Um, which according to the Audubon report, if we do act now, we can improve conditions of 76% of the birds at risk as well as many other species that are less observed than birds. So when I was making this project, it was it was super important to not only depict the data of the species vulnerability, but also to share the history of the passenger pigeon, summarize the main points of the paper, provide actions that can help the birds, and explain how to understand the, the wall layout. 
And I did this by incorporate, incorporating the infographics, which are also on this screen, uh, to help digest this information. One of the most important takes away in there is actions that can help the birds, such as big actions like voting and putting those in charge who will tackle climate change and protect the environment, and smaller actions like keeping cats indoors and making windows safer. Um, I do not wish for this piece to just be gloomy, but also to spark motivation that it's not too late. These birds on the wall, they're still here today. And um, yes, we did lose almost 3 billion birds, but we also did gain around 250 million birds, um, mostly waterfowl and raptors, thanks to conservation measures over the year. So that just goes to show that there is still hope. And I just want to conclude by mentioning that this project, Bye Bye Birdies, is tailored to the state that is exhibited in. Uh, so this one here I had in a Maryland show. So these birds are representing data of how birds would be in Maryland. Um, and I decided to tailor data so that locals can see birds that they may be familiar with and to learn and appreciate their names, colors, sizes, as well as whether or not they might be around as climate change worsens. I aim to continue building out this project in different forms and have it being have it be a traveling show, displaying and tailoring in multiple locations, sharing both the beauty and the plight of our friends. Thank you. Wow, amazing. Okay, Vida. Oh, I'm sorry. Vida? Vida, are you there? Yes, I uh, needed to unmute myself. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, well, I I am not an expert in various bird species. Uh, it's just that they really intrigued me, and uh, I I thank you for having me included in all of this. Um, I teach environmental ethics, and I am also you know I'm I have philosophy degrees, and I'm also an artist, and at one point, ideas and reading about it just wasn't enough for me, and I needed to express how I felt uh, about it all. So let me say a little about that. I often don't know what I'm going to do, uh, but I began walking on the beach in Alameda, and uh, I like to photograph children. I didn't know why, um, and nobody is recognizable, so I think it's okay. And I noticed all the birds. Uh, and the restoration of wetlands in the Bay Area. And I began to learn more about that, uh, baykeepers. And so there's bird sanctuaries in Alameda at the same time that there is this wetland restoration. So I began taking photographs of that too. And so I don't know a lot about the different species of birds, but I became really fascinated with how the birds would fly together, be together, and they knew what it was to be in a group and to coordinate action and uh, to more or less protect each other. And so at the same time that I'm looking at the wetland restoration, which is a way of protecting us and, and the, the kind of innocent play of children um, against the backdrop of a disaster, a lot of unfolding disasters. And so that's what this particular piece is, is about. Um, so, I mean, I have the suggestion of a disaster, but at the same time, uh, the children, the wetlands and the birds represent a kind of hopefulness that um, in the going forward for the future, and the birds coordinate so effortlessly. And we have so much to learn from the natural world. And I, I think that's mostly what motivated me because uh, reading the news and all of the things that I teach, you know, it's, it's very easy to become depressed. And so I, I needed a way to move forward in the midst of everything I read uh, and the children represent hope. I mean, I don't think about this a whole lot when I'm working, but it, it comes out through the process of work and kind of artists sort of move on the edge of an awareness and then it comes out in the image. 
Uh, and when I'm writing, it does the same sort of thing, but there's something really special about being able to have it coalesce in an image that doesn't have words. Mm -hmm. uh, so birds, wetlands, children, and restoration as a kind of hedge against um, the things we're all going to have to face, especially young people. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of it for <laughs> what I want <laughs> to say about this. Thank you. <laughs> You're okay. welcome. Great. Ah, okay, so this is Annie Rapstock's piece called From the Trapped Bird Series. So I'm going to read her statement. So just pretend like I'm her speaking from England, which is on a very different time zone. While I was on an arts residency in early 2023 in Wales in the United Kingdom, I went on a sunrise dawn chorus bird walk. We met with a ranger from a local bird charity to recognize, listen, and learn the sounds of various bird song. It struck me as an interesting activity, giving name to these birds and considering them as if as they went about their daily instinctual lives. I am trying with some difficulty to learn the name of birds and recognize their songs, to honor them and to give them the respect they are due. Many more male birds are researched and studied than female birds because they are more vocal and often significantly brighter in color. It is interesting that there is this gender bias amongst humans when it comes to birds. I live near Oxford in the United Kingdom. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but I hope to catch up with your talks on a recording very soon. My practice is mainly performance-based. I often work in kinship with the land and in conversation with animals, soil, water, and plants. I live in a small town very near the edge lands, and I am privileged to be surrounded by birds. One reintroduced species in the area is the red kite, formerly found in Asia and Africa, but now only found in Europe. The red kite is a medium-sized bird of prey with a forked tail feather and unusually small shrill call for its size. The photograph you see here entitled From the Trap Bird Series is from an ongoing project which includes performance art, video and photographic gestures in the landscape. The image was taken while on the residency in Wales that I mentioned. It is a still from a video filmed in the hills whilst I was walking. This work was recently seen in an exhibition entitled In the Likeness of Birds in Oxford, UK. Birds have been central to my research practice and life since the beginning of the pandemic. The abandoned farm structure immediately spoke to me of capture and entrapment and felt entirely appropriate to the work. By installing myself into the structure and looking out, I wanted to evoke a feeling of confinement in the photograph. It's clear I am wearing a mask and I am not a bird. In fact, by wearing a mask, the I of me becomes anonymous, one of many humans, everyone and anyone. By placing myself in the unlikely position of an imagined captured bird, I hope to evoke empathy and awaken us to the plight of birds and other threatened species. Through performative movement, I have become interested in the idea of mimicry, disguise, and gesture. I hope that by embodying and becoming bird or a human idea of birdness, I somehow offer the possibility of what it might feel like to be caged not having choice or autonomy, experiencing a possible threat to one's future. The live work, which is also a part of the series, has a soundtrack, which includes a spoken list of endangered birds on the threatened red list. The poignant song of a caged canary can be heard. These birds are often prized for their beautiful song, but are kept confined in tiny cages. Canaries were used in the mines from the late 1800s to detect gases such as carbon monoxide, which is poisonous to humans and canaries. They are much more sensitive to small amounts of the gas and so react more quickly than humans. Many species which seem common, such as the house sparrow and starling, have dropped in numbers in the last 25 years. If we do not change the mainly human impact of habitat loss, deforestation, pollution, and pesticide use, many birds will disappear. 
The small hope behind my image is a call for us to work together to change these practices. So that's what Annie has to say. So here we have Sheila. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Weed and thank you to Jane as well. It's really a wonderful opportunity to get to share my love of birds and be in this show with all of you. Um, my work is uh, largely personal and spiritual. I was taught from a really young age to pay attention to birds by my grandparents, especially pointing to and listening to birds in and around their home in Northern Florida and my great grandmother's home in Southern Alabama. So learning, naming them and uh, whistling back at them was something that I started to do really young. Um, and I, this piece is, is called Between Here and There. I uh, made it during the pandemic when I found myself uh, really stuck um, and in a whole new realm between both of my kids really suffering, teenage kids really suffering, and my mother re recently diagnosed with dementia. Uh, so I was caring for um, all of them and trying to find my way. And a lot of that time uh, spent walking around the bays, uh, around the San Pablo Bay uh, and, San, and San Francisco Bay. And um, I've always watched for birds and paid attention to uh, birds. Hummingbirds were really important for a long time. We just kind of show up uh, spontaneously when it's, and it seemed appropriate to me. It seemed to help me make a decision to confirm I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, and I started to, to see turkey vultures a lot and was concerned at first that I was seeing so many turkey vultures and thought it was a bad omen, uh, but learned that they were actually um, representing change, necessary change that needed to happen. And that made a lot of sense for the situations that I was dealing with, that we were all gonna have to change. We were all gonna have to embrace that. Um, and also the great blue heron has been a bird that I've admired for a long, long time. Was really overwhelmed the first time I saw one. It flew overhead in, in a forested area and the wingspan just took me by complete surprise and took my breath away just how big it was. And I've since, you know, come to look at them in particular and, and I think now really all birds as messengers um, and as wisdom keepers and, and beings that can go between here and there and bring back wisdom or be examples of ways that we can live um, uh, in relationship to uh, our world uh, rather than in uh, in opposition to uh, our world. Um, this piece is, uh, most of my work actually is drawing, begins with drawing. So this is actually one of the first times that I drew directly on a wood panel. Uh, so drew the heron directly on and then started to add other imagery and playing with wood grain and pattern, kind of imbuing uh, it with a feeling of water uh, and the sun and the moon and other planets and uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thought I saw something flash up on the screen there for a second. Um, and it was, I feel like I get to know them in a way and honor them in a way when I, I, I take the time to, to draw, to draw them. And then this piece actually became a part of a temporary wall mural. Uh, at the time I was making all kinds of pieces that were um, significant to me and my up Bringing. There was a blue jay, there was the turkey vulture I mentioned, there was the heron, a hummingbird, uh, swallows, um, and uh, had them printed and cut them all out to make a mural that included a portrait of myself and both of my children to kind of create a kind of prayer of our, of our story in a way, praying for our resilience and our connection to and paying attention to uh, the, the birds and other wildlife um, and environment that surrounds us and influences us. And um, and I think overall, just, I, I think I've always kind of um, searched for connection and, and listening to the bird song and playing in the garden was a way that I did that as an only child uh, at a really, again, like a really young age. And I still find myself very much doing that when I'm alone and walking along the bay, looking for signals and signs of, of how we can 
um, how we can be connected. And I really do look at them as kin, uh, feel that connection and, uh, and want to hold them and revere them in that way and hope to inspire others to do the same. Uh, so thank you for the time. And I really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak about work and listening, listen to other people speak about their work. Thank you. Yep. Hmm. Okay, Michelle. Hey, um, well, first, thank you to Weed for and and to Jane Kim. I'm just thrilled with this show and I was so excited to see the theme and that Jane was going to um, be the juror because I follow her work and I really love it. So um, I am speaking from unceded Awaswas land, the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, which is um, between San Jose, Silicon Valley and Monterey Bay. And I am a painter and an environmental activist. I focus on wildlife issues. My painting is called Professor Macaw is Not a Bird Brain. And it's from a series I did of genius animals. Um, although Professor Macaw here is the only professor um, that I've painted. Um, and I originally painted it for a show at Cactus Gallery in Los Angeles. Professor Macaw is busy teaching calculus and she wants everyone to know that humans are not the only intelligent species on earth. This painting is my attempt to inject levity into what I consider to be an important subject, which is animal cognition. There's more and more scientific studies all the time showing that non-human animals are capable of complex cognition and deep emotions. Probably a lot of people um, have heard of, um, oh my gosh, I'm my brain is all of a sudden forgot the name of the African gray parrot, but the scientist is named Irene Pepperberg, Pepperberg Alex the African gray. Um, I should know that because my cat is named Alex. Anyway, um, she was really you know, one of the first scientists to, to push back on um, this is in her own field against studying the intelligence of birds. And, and she found a lot, um, but there's a lot going on. With these animals, and you know, now it's a lot more mainstream, and, and there's more um, there's more research about this. But sadly, most people in industrialized cultures, at least, still believe that non-human animals are below us in importance, and really don't realize how intelligent and emotional these creatures are. And I think that that is really convenient for us because when we view non-human animals as inferior, we can excuse our treatment of them. We can, ex we can excuse the fact that we destroy their habitat, that we hunt them for trophies, that we're causing an extinction crisis for birds and all species really, um, that we incarcerate and torture their bodies in laboratories, factory farms and the like with impunity. And I really believe um, after <laughs> a lot of years of doing environmental activism and trying to understand why the needle doesn't get moved far with these issues, I really believe that human exceptionalism is the root of why we're destroying the life support systems of the planet. And that the consequent climate crisis, the extinction crisis, and all of the environmental disasters that we're seeing are symptoms. Um, they're causes for sure, but they're also symptoms um, of our you know, most of us believing that um, our humans are most the most important species and that our interests are the most important. Industrial humans are so disconnected from the natural world and so many don't understand that we also need wild nature for our survival on every level, including spiritual. And very sadly, our governments are, you know, mostly about supporting big business and, and not life, whether the lives are human or non-human. And I know we have some people in the exhibit and probably some people watching who are not from the US, but I'll speak to the US. We have great environmental laws here. And, um, you know, but they're constantly skirted in favor of industry and, and in favor of development and the extraction industry. So it's really frustrating. Um, so I'm going to close with one of my favorite quotes about non human animals. I just love this quote. It's from Henry Beston, the author. We need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, humans, his original quote says man, but I don't like that. So humans in civilization survey the creature through the glass of our knowledge and see thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. 
We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate, for having taken form so, so far below ourselves. And therein do we err. For the animal shall not be measured by humans. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with the extension of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for including me. And I love being able to hear the other artists talk about their work. I'm just, I think this is great. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. And Mary, would you like to read Nanette's statement? Yes, here, we'll get it up here. This is called Entanglements, 2022. The black intaglio aspect of this work is taken from my own footprints in mud, sloshed across paper, then photographed, printed to film to create the intaglio plate. The footprints source may not be obvious, but rather is a layer of meaning. As an image, they allude to landform seen by an aerial perspective. The hummingbird is central, threatened by entanglement with a human-built environment. My interests include language, personality, difference, belief systems, ideas, movement, reflection, identity, perception, structure, stories, socialization, definitions, context, memory, experience, the natural world, change, and residue. That's Nanette's statement. Okay. This is our final piece. And this is my piece. It is called Pull the Feathers to Protect the Bird. And I made this piece to bring electromagnetic frequency impacts on life into the conversation about birds in flight. I just read that 2 million satellites have been permitted to beam various frequencies at the earth that biology here has never before experienced. This experiment has no control. Uh, there will be no areas that will be safe havens. So we actually have no idea what the impact of all this uh, blasting of the earth is going to be. Uh, Canadian scientists working for the government determined that birds' feathers act as antenna and receptors for radio frequency radiation, directing it di deeply into their bodies. When they exposed chickens to strong microwave radiation, the birds collapsed, but not if they had first been defeathered. Uh, even if only their tail feathers were exposed, they would scream, defecate, and try to escape. So in this piece, I am imagining the absurdity of vacuum plucking living birds' feathers in order to protect them from EMF radiation. In Maui, there's a native bird called the kiwi kiu, a tiny one ounce yellow bird that is extremely endangered. The so estimates are maybe from 50 to like 200 or so birds left. Researchers attempted to move 13 of them to a new forest where native trees had just been replanted. An essential part of that involved attaching radio transmitters to their legs. With about, within about two and a half weeks, all were dead, except the three or four who managed to remove or disable their transmitters. Some died within days of receiving the transmitter. Many were witnessed frantically trying to remove the transmitter off their leg. Did researchers consider the possibility that the transmitters could have had an impact on the birds? It was as though, it was as though a cell phone was attached around the clock to these tiny creatures. No, they concluded it must have been malaria that killed them, even though the way things unfolded was totally unlike that disease vector. And but even they acknowledged that the one bird that is still alive years later that they know of for sure 
does not have a transmitter and never got malaria. So given the extremity of this sacrifice from such a tiny population, we would think that every possible explanation would be considered. But as I'm wanting to point out, we have this incredible blind spot about considering the impact of our digital technology and our little gadgets that we think are gonna help us help the birds. In 2022 in the Netherlands, 18 new 4G antenna were added to three cell towers that were right on the edge of the Deep Hatton Nature Preserve. Many other towers at greater distance served a shipping channel that, and happened to be beaming their frequencies across the channel, also at the preserve. 7,000 of the endangered seabirds called sandwich terns were nesting in that preserve. Within days of the 4G installations, 3,000 of those birds literally dropped dead, like sitting ducks. Arthur Furstenberg, author of The Invisible Rainbow, suggests a rule. A sudden dramatic increase in the number of antennas and frequencies whose source is within a breeding colony or on its border is lethal. Nesting birds cannot avoid the radiation. They must either abandon their nests or die. He writes more in his uh, newsletter about other, other uh, preserves where likewise nesting birds have dropped dead from increased electromagnetic radiation in the area. Authorities blamed this on avian flu, even though nearby a similar population in a preserve that was not being irradiated had no casualties. Did the researchers notice the increase in frequencies and their possible impact? No, they did not. They did, no they did notice the anomaly that workers going in and removing dead birds, which should have reduced the, reduced the spread of the disease, instead resulted in more birds dying. One possible explanation is that, of that is that they all carried cell phones and were using them, and so that increased the amount of radiation coming from the towers into the preserve, aimed at the birds, and might have caused the increased deaths. It was noted that in 2023, the sandwich terns who returned chose areas in nature preserves that were as far as possible from towers. Wildlife biologist Alfonso Balmoral Martinez in Spain over decades observed the changes in populations of birds when cell towers were installed. Proximity to a cell tower could impact the number of eggs laid, the number of eggs that actually hatched, survival and vigor of the hatchlings, how many babies were deformed. He reports the behavior of the birds that nested within 100 meters of a tower was troubling. Stork couples fought over nest construction. Sticks fell to the ground while the couple tried to build the nest. Some nests were never completed and the storks remained passively in front of the cell site antenna. So that's, he, he did a tremendous amount of observational work really documenting the decreases in many different species in the areas where he was observing, you know, proximity or the, the installation of cell phone towers. So we're being told that in the U.S., something like 30 percent of our birds have disappeared in the last 50 or so years. You know, we, if we care, we have to consider every possible hypothesis about why that is happening. Our attachment to our digital technology must not cause us to turn a blind eye to the impacts of EMFs. A scholarly literature search for electromagnetic plus biological effects produces the astonishing number of 76,400 studies. It's not like there's not information out there about what's happening. There's no lack of evidence that electro electromagnetic pollution is impacting us as well. Many people are developing electromagnetic sensitivities. I would just like to say that I think we need to really become aware of this blind spot and make every effort to begin to pay attention to how our gadgets and our frequencies are impacting life. And the precautionary principle would suggest that we keep some areas that are completely free of uh, EMF frequencies, you know? And I mean, the proper experimentation requires that there be a control. So there should be areas that are free of these kinds of, these kinds of frequencies so that we can observe what happens. Observational studies always report that animals gravitate to areas where there's not a lot of cell phone or other frequencies happening. 
And they note that when suddenly, you know, a cell phone tower is turned off for repair or for some other reason, suddenly the animals and the birds come back. And then when it's turned on again, they go away again. So I think that we need to really open our eyes uh, as responsible citizens of a living biological world and really be willing to see what it is that we're that we are doing in the world. And, you know, maybe these birds really are canaries in the coal mine and they're signaling to us. So thank you. That's my sobering report. Okay, the good news is we have a wonderful art and science panel coming up on Sunday, January 14th, uh, 4 to 5.30 p.m. so that people on the East Coast or anywhere can tune in. We're calling it Artists and Scientists Winging It Together, Strategizing for Avian Conservation. So I hope that we can get lots of people to come because it should be really interesting. Um, and Jane will be representing artists on the panel. So, okay. All right, well, thank you all. We're going to just uh, close this part of the session and then we'll start the questions and answers in a minute. Um, just for those of you who came in later, um, WEED's vision is to continue for another decade as our global network of women activists, artists grows. And we're in the midst of rebuilding our artist directory. And we're also looking at new programming and ways to do more virtual exhibitions. So please give generously to support this vision, either by visiting the donut button button, the donate button on our website, or uh, I also put the address in the chat. Um, also, another note, we're looking for volunteers to help with the monthly newsletter and three new board members. We need someone who knows WordPress and is interested in helping with the upgrade. We are halfway through it. Someone who's interested in social media and communications and someone who wants to work with members and membership to develop new programming. And we, they would need to be able to contribute 12 hours a month. So if you know anybody, please send them our way to the website to info at weedartist.org. So thank you very much. We'll end this recording right now, and then we'll start up a new recording for questions and answers and discussion.